Hey folks, it's Chris, welcome back. So last night was something of a classical astrophotography night for me. I mean, I had a ton of things in mind when setting up my telescope. Some of them worked like a charm, some of them failed in a disastrous manner, and some things just appeared out of nothing and saved the night. And it's this up and down that makes this hobby so worthwhile. You can't predict what will happen, anything can work out just fine or everything can just crash, and sometimes there's an unexpected guest waiting. So, I had a list in mind of things I wanted to try this evening. First things, I had a new license of SharpCap Pro. For those of you unaware, SharpCap is a mighty and widespread capturing software, mostly used for planetary imaging. It supports nearly all available cameras on the market and it's very easy to use. SharpCap has one mighty feature among countless others. It supports a fast way of polar aligning your scope. I will devote an entire video series to this topic, but in short. SharpCap calculates the star positions of the Polaris region through your scope, then asks you to rotate your scope, calculates the positions again, calculates the rotational center of your mount, and then compares this result with the known celestial pole, and then finally gives assumptions on how to fine-tune your mount. And this method works very intuitive and you can precisely pole on any mount in a matter of minutes. Very handy. I mean, the pole master can do the same, but as I already have a working guide scope, I thought I can simply use this to pole align my scope. And what shall I say? As expected, SharpCap pole alignment is just a charm to use. Very easy, very fast. Nevertheless, I think it's worth devoting an entire evening to practice this method. So, the prime goal this evening was to capture a decent image of Mars. But as Mars was only high in the sky at around 3am, I had some time to spare. So I decided to test the long exposure capabilities and the precision of sharp capola alignment procedure uh, together with guiding. It is like the third time I use my new Skywatcher EQ6R Pro mode, and till now I have to say I love it. I practice plate solving, so where am I in the night sky, object framing, and connected ATP, a dedicated astro imaging program for my DSLR, with PHD, the guiding aka fine-tuning program for tracking the night sky with superb precision, and even got dithering working. Dithering, this is when you shift your image between each exposure to dramatically reduce noise. I mean, this was kinda new to me, not in theory, but in practice, as my old mount wasn't capable of doing such things. And oh man, Astro has such a steep learning curve. When everything worked out, I pointed the scope towards M31, the Andromeda galaxy. The pointing accuracy is something that really sets my new Skywatcher EQ6R Pro with its belt drive apart from the old EQ3. Slew, and there you are. No more fiddling, no more searching. It's great. I plan to image M31 half the night until 3am and then focus on Mars. With this setup running, I went to bed. 3am in the morning. Oh man, I don't know why I'm doing this. On the other hand, if Chuck can do it, I can do it too. Hi Chuck. Let's see, what do we have? Oh fail, nothing worked! And why that? With everything set up, I simply forgot to connect the laptop with the power supply. <laughs> Thereby it set itself into sleep mode after 50 minutes and effectively ends the session. So that was it, that's what I got from M31. 15 minutes of data where I expected 3 hours of data, just because I forgot one cable. I mean, that's so astro, and everyone will go through such moments when taking images of the night sky, especially if the setup is relatively new. Astro imaging just have so many factors to keep in mind. Okay, so lost M31, but Mars is still ahead. I changed the camera from my DSLR to the planetary webcam. I use a ZW OASI 120MCS color camera. It's a beginner level color camera for around, let's say, 150 bucks. You can't expect the world from a camera like that, but it's affordable and easy to use. In addition, I used a 3x Barlow lens to increase my focal length from 750mm to over 2 meters, and that will help to magnify the planets as needed. So the first glance on Mars, there it is. Alright, still looks a bit small to me. Okay, let's crop the field of view even further. And take some AV video files. So, this is the result. Actually, it's way smaller than I anticipated. Why so? I had no idea. 
And then, oh no, I left the binning two times from an earlier session checked, thereby 2x2 two two pixels will be counted as one pixel and effectively increasing the sensitivity of the camera but of course drastically reducing the resolution. One button could have ruined my session again, but okay, turn it on and reset the exposure time, that looks better. Look at that, that is the live view of Mars through my telescope. I mean, see that white blob at the bottom? That's actually the Martian pole cap you're looking at, from our backyard. This is why I love this hobby so much. Right away, the live view is way better than any image I have ever taken of Mars so far. Can it get any better than this? Look at that, that is the stacked and sharpened image of Mars. Look at the terrain details, the valleys and mountainsides, the polar cap and the face, stunning. And all that with my cheap ZWOSI 120MCS, really great. And this is our Mars next to the NASA rendering from JPL. You can see the different terrain details showing up in our image of this night, spectacular. What was that? Right in the middle of the Mars sequence, I heard a strange noise right next to me. My heart nearly stopped. And when I took a closer look, I surprisingly uncovered a very unexpected guest. An adult hedgehog was wondering what on earth this stupid human being was doing in his garden in the middle of the night. But when I said nothing and did nothing but stargazing, he surely got bored and left the scene. Funny guy. Okay, and then I had a short look at Stellarium, the planetarium software I control my mount with, and saw Uranus. I wondered, hey, could I capture Uranus with my planetary webcam? Was that even possible? I slew to Uranus and missed it, I don't know, by half a field of view. My trick for planetary goes like this. Using the main scope with the 3x Barlow attached and the ultra small sensor for the ZWOSI, that gives me such a small FOV that plate solving is way too slow or is not working at all. Thereby I aligned the main scope and the guide scope very, very precisely and then plate solved the much wider field of view of the guide scope. That actually works pretty good. So plate solve, update the scope with a new position and re -slew. Even so, Uranus appeared so dim on my main scope that I wasn't sure I was looking at the right thing. So I plate solved a bunch of test shots online and compared the coordinates just to be sure. And thankfully, in addition to that, Uranus showed a faint blue color on longer exposures. Okay, okay, it was Uranus, but I needed half a second of exposure time to make Uranus visible. But there it was, a faint and dim blue dot in the night sky. This is the live view of Uranus. And this, this is the final stack result. It's like many astro images, it doesn't look like much, it's a faint blue dot. But it means a lot to me. My very first image of such a distant world, the ice giants. Wow. Yeah, and there I was. Already the night sky had shared more with me than I had expected. And then I looked east and saw a bright shining star. It of course was no star, but Venus rising just before sunrise. Everything was set up, so why not? One slew later and Venus was just in frame. Way, I mean way brighter than Uranus. Over half a second of exposure time for Uranus on the one hand and 6 milliseconds for Venus. This planet is much closer to the Sun and much closer to us and the global cloud coverage reflects most of the light back to us. The face of Venus and quite a bit of color was easily visible in the live view, even though I had better views on Venus in the past. Just rising, Venus was quite low in the sky and thereby a thick atmosphere disturbed the image of Venus quite a bit. Nevertheless, I took some very nice video files of Venus and stacked them later on. This is one of the stacked and sharpened results. I really like it. Even though my last result was slightly sharper, oddly enough the color was quite reddish this night. I don't know why. Maybe the reddish tone comes from the longer way through the atmosphere? I really don't know. And now? Everything done this night? <laughs> no. Shortly after Venus, a beautiful crescent moon rose behind my roof. What a sight. Venus and Moon dancing a silent duo in the morning dawn. I shot a few videos of the crescent and stacked them together. This is the stack result and this is much sharper than any one-shot image could ever be. Finally, I watched the dark side of the Moon being illuminated from the reflected light of Earth within my sensitive guide cam and I really love the sight of the two sides of the Moon being visible at once. So hey, why not? 
I got my DSLR back out and with the much bigger sensor I took a bunch of one-shot exposures of the entire disc and varied the exposure time while doing so. Till now I wasn't able to merge them into one HDR image, but the images are pretty on their own I think. And then at 5.30am I called it a night and shoved my scope back into the chat and went to bed. What a night! A totally ruined DSLR deep sky session due to my own stupidity, me nearly giving up the night and then a planetary run through the night, one highlight after the other and finishing with the stars slowly disappearing into the next day's dawn. And that's it. That's how astro imaging can be. Exciting, frustrating, surprising, quite beautiful, of course sleepless, but never boring. So I hope you liked this journey. Thanks for sticking with me. Clear skies everyone and see you next time here on Catching Photons.